In this original podcast series, we take a peek behind the curtain of some of the world's biggest film events and talk to some of the industry leaders and working pros across every department of independent film and television to find out what it's really like. The Hub is a weekly in-depth chat about all things film and television, what movies are featuring at the upcoming GMA Awards ceremony, past winners, premieres, nominees, red carpet gossip, career advice, and insider info to help you better prepare prepare for a career in the film industry. You're listening to The Hub, your weekly fix for all things film and television, and some other stuff, hosted and by Jason indeed, Matthewson. Indeed, indeed, Welcome along, everyone. This is episode number nine, live stream number nine. However, it will be episode number 11 in season one. Uh, please know that we are going out, as always, on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. You can get us live on all of those, as well as on the socials, as well. Uh, and that nicely brings us on to our episode today. We are talking to my very good friend, longtime friend, writer, director, and all around awesome dude, Mr. Lance S.A. Nelson. Good afternoon, my friend. How are you? Good afternoon. If only I was an industry leader. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can quite classify myself in that that, that esteemed category. Uh, but, uh, uh, well... I'm sort of a bit sheepish, <laughs> sort of bit sheepish with that introduction. I'm, Maybe you should have like a B-list uh, uh, intro uh, <laughs> for some of us lesser mortals who are a bit further down the ladder. And, yeah. Uh, today we're talking to the more struggling creatives <laughs> who are still fighting to get up. <laughs> Love it. That that that'll be a weird brief to send through to my voiceover guy. Can you do me a voiceover that's a, just a bit shit? <laughs> Give me for looking away uh, <laughs> from the um, screen. Yeah, no, just to let everyone know that, as I said, we're, we're going out live. Um, we're going to be on, I think, for quite a while today. Uh, we got lots and lots and lots to talk about. We got loads of people watching in and listening in, and uh, I'm sure they're going to have their questions. Um, so please do get them into the comments section. And as always, I'd like to start off just by, especially in this time, asking you, um, how's things? How are you, how you coping? You losing your losing your marbles yet? No, I mean, the funny thing is, is I was going through a pretty tough period in my life, uh, particularly last year, and, and that sort of resulted in me being really financially quite a, quite, a, quite a difficult position financially, couldn't really afford to um, go out or, or sort of, uh, you know, go to, go to restaurants, so I had to... I had to cut down the number of events that I went to support. Um, if friends of mine had plays on, I had to kind of beg them to give me a free ticket, and whereas usually I would pay for one. Mm. So, um, so my life hadn't really changed that much because I couldn't, I couldn't really afford to go out and do very much. Yeah. So I was sort of basically staying in and doing my own thing and focusing mainly on writing. And and uh, the, the main thing that uh, that I miss is doing the work with the outcast, which I guess we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. Mm. So so compared to some people, I think I've had it a bit easier because I was already going through a period of adjustment, mm. and that period of adjust, adjustment involves staying in a lot and not spending money and not going out. Yeah. So uh, I can't say that I suddenly had to go through this radical change, unlike somebody like my friend Alex Walton, who was in the middle of doing a great play, and literally it had just opened, and he was, funny enough, he was playing a, a paratrooper based on the life of uh, Stuart um, Hardy, uh, Stuart Cardy. And um, and his play, you know, of course, got pulled. And and they did a lot of work on that show to get that show up and running. And imagine to go through all that, get your play up in a really prestigious off-West End uh, venue, theatre venue, and then suddenly, boom, your show's off. So I, I consider yeah. myself quite lucky that I hadn't just managed to get one of my own projects off the ground and then suddenly we were cancelled. I mean, that would have just completely demoralised me after everything else I've been through in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think... So I think one of the lucky ones, really, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I guess I agree with you, actually. I think as the, as the creatives, i.e. yourself, myself, and, and the you know, the millions of other creatives around the world for whatever facet that presents itself in, uh, I don't know that it's a huge difference for us like okay so business wise corona's fucked everything basically e economically wise and business wise it screwed everything but personally anyway at least uh, before this i did 
work from home quite a bit. Um, I, I done writing and producing and p- creating packs and all that because I did all that from home or on a laptop. Um, you know, you and I did. We don't have to go out to like a nine to five job every day. That that routine is now broken. You know, there's no kids running around that we need to take to school no, and all that I'm, kind of stuff. So I'm lucky in a lot of ways, but the one area I'm not lucky in is it. It will impact me later when it's finished. And if I stop and think about that, I go crazy. It, I, it, I went through a pretty... I think everybody goes through dips during this thing, and I had a bit of a bad dip a couple of weeks ago okay. where I really, you know, I stopped and thought about it and thought about how much money I'm going to owe. I can't afford all my rent at the moment, and that, that debt is just building and building and building. And I, I know there's a lot of other people in that situation, and again, a lot of them worse than me. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can only look at your life out of your own window, you know, so... Um, oh, oh, Eric yeah. Blakeney, who who uh, I had on a couple of whatever four or five days ago, uh, made a very good point. We were talking about a similar situation to this, and and we were talking about the the people who, on the face of it, looked like crazy folks. Who, well, he was referring to the Americans because he's American, so he was referring to the people who are who are. I know, right? But he was referring to the folks that are like gun wielding, marching on the capitals in America and demanding that the the representatives of the various states and cities and so forth open those states and cities again. Now, while they're very wrong in that action, um, I th- he made a very good point, and that is this: that the the thoughts that you've just been having and not you know thinking about. A f- forward and going how much am i going to make can i cover rent can i still cover my car do i need to sell this do i need to get rid of that so on so on <laughs> okay i'm going to give you a little context in a second what that means but what he said basically was that these are vulnerable people these are the people that society are not going to protect you know they're not the bankers and the politicians and the fortune 500 and the fucking the people running hedge funds it's the regular folks that'll get left behind and it will be slapped with a big tax bill, be slapped with the extra VAT and all the extra stuff. And uh... The world can't go back to the way it was. I think there has to be a massive change and, and um, for that massive change to have to happen, there's going to be some really gutsy decisions that are going to have to be taken. You know, one thing that could happen is that we just wipe out world debt. And by world debt, I don't mean for the banks and the big people. Oh, no, no, no. In debt for every single person who's got a credit card every single person who's over on their mortgage, it's not going to happen. No one's going to do that. No. Um, but that's the sort of, I'm talking about radical thinking on that level because people like um, Extinction Rebellion, and uh, I took part in a couple of their protests last year. You know, 10 years ago, they would have been considered a niche organization who everybody thought was crazy. Mm-hmm. But now you've got really prestigious people screaming from the rooftops and a lot of proof to back it up that basically we're destroying this world and i kind of look a bit like the coronavirus as a bit of a warning saying actually the planet's trying to heal itself and Mm -hmm. you know get lost i don't want to talk about corona too much because no no you've done that with all your other guests and we could chat about it for half an hour and all the social impacts it's going to have but yeah um uh, and we could, but uh, I don't think anything I say is going to make the blindest bit of difference to anybody listening. Sadly, unfortunately, um, no. But I mean, on the upside, to 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 kind of put a put a cap on the Corona conversation. But the the only upside, or maybe not the only one, but one that I recently heard was I had a, I had a conversation with one of my investors this morning, who is uh, who's British, but he's he's uh, hanging out in in Marbella with his family. Um, I'm not <laughs> I know, right? That's- I wish I was hanging out. Uh, I know. In after the coronavirus. If you're listening, Adam, um, uh, send me a sangria. Uh, but yeah, he was saying that um, I've lost my train of thought now. What was he saying? Um, I don't know what he was saying. Uh, oh, that was, that, was that was it. That was it. That was it. That was it. That in Spain um, tomorrow they're opening the bars and so forth again and restaurants. Now, not to full capacity, but like you can go for a beer. Wearing a mask and a gloves, and you need. How does, that, how does that work, though? I mean, how does that work? I mean, how are they going to do social distancing? I mean, just give you an example: men's toilets in bars are quite small. Yeah. And women will know from going to bars that they often have to queue for quite some time while women do their makeup and they're trying to get in the the two cubicles, including the one that's broken, to do their business order. Men queuing in 
in the in toilets in bars, even a bar that's not that busy, mm-hmm. can be quite a negotiation when you get into that little room and you're trying to slide between people. How do we do social distancing when we're going to the loo? Absolutely. I mean, this, is, this is nonsense. Absolutely. Opening the bars is is a, is the I can't think of a more crazy idea because you go to bars to talk and to socialise people, and mm-hmm. bars have music on and the music is loud, and so. To talk to people, you know, Ben Elton did a brilliant sketch about this way back in the 80s. You have to get quite close to people and you have to shout to be heard. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have bars with no music and no football games on the television so that people... And also... ...stand close to each other. Just simple simple things like that. People aren't thinking it through properly. But Lance... when, when people can't stay home and wash their hands and not touch themselves and touch other things when they're stone cold sober, what the hell are you going to do when they're hammered? Because alcohol is an inebriant, of course. So we're going to take away the music and the alcohol from the bar. Therefore, it's just a place now. You know what anyway, I mean? Maybe it's crazy. We should talk about we should talk about films and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and creative I, things. That, I feel like this is going to be a long one, so uh, I, I'm pacing myself. Anymore. Uh, just though. Know there's people tuning in to hear about uh, Paratrooper and what's happened with uh, Pegasus Bridge and Diamonds in the Sky and. Awesome. Blah, blah, blah. A whole load of things we got to talk about. Okay, we'll jump so. over then to uh, to the first one of those. Uh, so I think we're going to talk about, let's see, let's do Borderlands uh, first. But before we just, yeah. just before we do that, I'm going to pop the poster and, and the trailer up on, on the screen in a second. We'll have a chat about it. I'm going to jump into the Facebook feed here. Uh, Henrietta, uh, Ashina, David, and Steen are all uh, chiming in. They're watching here. Uh, so, guys, if you have any questions at all or any comments, or anything at all, really, just you want to, you know, contribute to the conversation, um, pop it into the comments and on any of the various platforms that you may be watching in on. What's that? That might be Steen, that might be Steen my stunt coordinator. It uh, is, yeah, Steen um, Young. Yeah, yeah. He's a, do you know what? He's a really, really uh, lovely guy. Um, there's two stunt coordinators that I know personally in, this, in the industry that I would really recommend. Um, Steen Young is, is one of them, and he's kind of my go-to guy. Hmm. And the other one is Dan Styles, who's a, a, a another really lovely guy. Okay. Uh, great, great um, with people, and um, really knows his stuff. And he's really come a long way. And I'm, I'm so I've known Dan a long time back in the day from when he used to snack. And I'm so so proud of uh, everything he's achieved. Uh, I'm going to be giving quite a few shout outs uh, to other people I know today, actually, which um, is quite unusual for most people. They usually just talk about themselves for two hours. Actually, gonna, before we before we get to Borderlands, I wanna I wanna talk about somebody that you can give a shout out to, and that is uh, the one and only Mister Tom Hanks. Tell me that story. Uh, yes, Hanks, yes. <laughs> Tell me that story. I tweeted him last night, by the way. So let, okay, so let's see if he gets, to, comes back to me. So I, d- I doubt Tom Hanks and Reed Wilson are watching, but uh, if they are, uh, Mister Hanks, <laughs> just so you know, I followed your career since you did Bachelor Party which I saw as a double bill at the cinema in the 80s with another film called Revenge of the Nerds. And actually, they were both really funny films. I mean, they're both really un-PC and very 80s. But um, I, I, Tom Hanks did a lot of improvisation in Bachelor Party, and, and he was I could tell he was like really talented just from watching that, that film, which was very much of the, the Porky's kind of um, mould. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so I been a huge fan of his way before Saving Private Ryan and all that. I watched all of his films like Volunteers and The Man with the One Red Shoe and some Big. of the stuff that, that didn't get cinema releases mm-hmm. over here. So when I um, did sort of the first feature film I was reasonably proud of, which was The Journey, uh, which was set in Greece. And of course, uh, Rita Wilson is a massive fan of all things Greece. And she introduced that to Tom, her husband. So, um, uh, because of the uh, of the death of a couple of people that I work with uh, in in the last 24 months, uh, about a year and a half ago, I started this thing called the 100 Letters Project. And if you go to my blog, and you can put the link up yourself now for that page, I do. Yeah, um, which uh, yeah is the Diamonds in the Sky, and then the 100 Letters Project. Um, there's a link for that um, under the blog. Just go to the blog, and it's the last blog I did. And You'll see a picture of Kevin Bacon and things like this. It's basically, I also I also had a near death experience as well, not that long ago, about a year ago. Uh, so I decided I was going to write to a hundred people that I'd always wanted to work with or mm-hmm. work who's who I had admired, mm-hmm. but 
there were probably people that I, w I wasn't going to get a chance to work with in my lifetime. Um, another one of those on that list, for example, is Charles Grodin. He's an actor I really, really love. Another one is Albert Brooks, the actor-director oh, Albert Brooks. Who wonderful, did, wonderful. Did God the rest. film Defending Your Life. He did the film Broadcast News. He's phenomenal. I absolutely love him. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to get to work with him. It's just not going to happen. I, uh, I'm not being negative. There's a, a big list of younger people that I think I have got a shot of working with. So I, I just wanted to write a, a letter to each one of these people saying, oh, you know, just been an admirer of your work. I, I'm not looking for a signed photograph or anything. I'm not even looking for a reply, but just to let you know, it always been my desire to, to work with you. One of the people that I wrote to first on that list was Gene Hackman. Oh, legend. Even <laughs> among legends, he's a legend. <laughs> Uh, when people say who's your favourite actor of all time, and I mean, most people say De Niro or Pacino, and they're definitely both in my top ten. Yeah, but me the too. One actor when I was a young director that I always wanted to work with was Gene Hackman. Uh, I'm sure it would have been an experience because I've heard that you don't direct Gene Hackman, he directs you. Are you smoking a spliff? Am I smoking a spliff? No. Oh, okay. All right. Just, just checking. Um, so, uh, just for those kids watching, that is a, it's a fake roll-up cigarette. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I wrote to Tom Hanks, and, and Tom Hanks has worked with production designer and art director Alan Tompkins, and Alan Tompkins got me his office address, and Alan Tompkins also wrote him an email to let Tom know that this letter was coming to him um, from this director that... Um, Alan was working with because Alan's been an advisor for me both on Paratrooper and Pegasus Bridge, which I'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. And so I sent a copy for Tom and Rita. Here it is. I'm holding it up to the screen now of the journey, and I signed it to them, and uh, with a letter. And it, of the 100 letters, the, these were the only people I was sending them a copy of my work. With everybody else, it was just a letter. I, I guess you call it kind of like a fan letter. Mm -hmm. But because they, they, they're into all things green, I thought I'd send them a copy of this. And uh, I sent it via Playtone Pictures. And you know how it is with America and lawyers and everything else. Nothing unsolicited. Mm -hmm. So uh, just start, I, I sent it, um, I think it was the first week of January. It was on my New Year's to-do list. And I got it back, uh, returned to sender oh. in uh, the second week of February so, Tom, if you ever watch, I tried to send you this, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't get. And there was a very lovely letter in there as well. And I, I thought if Alan Tompkins let him know it was coming, mm -hmm. we, we would negate that kind of lawyers on the front door uh, thing. Because I didn't want anything from him. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to send him that letter. And it was quite a, quite a long letter about all the things in his career that I've enjoyed. And I, I, I'm also told by lots of my friends that have worked with him, that he's one of the nicest guys in the industry, and I believe it. He comes across that way. Um, so, yeah, so I um, sent, sent that off uh, to him. Another person that I always wanted to work with uh, that I'm not going to get to is Judy Dench. Oh, and, uh, another and another legend. And I've act I actually wrote... I, I, you have no idea the lengths that I went to in the last 10 years to try and work with her. I wrote a script especially for her and her daughter to do because I knew she was getting older and I knew her eyesight was having issues. Mm -hmm. And I thought the best thing to do is to write a film for her and her daughter to be in together where they're playing mother and daughter and uh, set it somewhere really nice so that basically they can go on holiday and we can make a movie. And I wrote this film set in uh, Sardinia uh, called The Kiss That Would li Last a Lifetime about this old couple meeting in their um, 70s who fell in love as kids at the school gates. And that was my big stab at trying to get to work with Judy. Uh, I don't need to write Judy a letter as part of the 100 Letters Project because I already know Judy and she knows I always wanted to work with her. And I, I've been very fortunate enough to meet her many times and have champagne with her in her dressing room a couple of times, which is right. endlessly entertaining. Absolutely and I just tell you, absolutely amazing woman. Uh, and if you look at Finty Williams, her daughter's Twitter, you can see Judy's doing things like dressing up in bunny rabbit outfits in the garden and doing silly things with ears to make people laugh during Corona. <laughs> and, um, it's not much else that. that she can do, but she's as nice as she seems. I can I can tell you. And, and 
always been very supportive of my work and I, I wrote to her fairly regularly and uh, you know a couple of times a year and she would always reply always mm. even if it's three to six months for her to get back to me always always reply I've never had the pleasure of, of meeting her, really. I was on um, on uh, Ken Branagh's uh, Murder on the Orange Express for a couple of days, and, uh, right. of course, she's in that. So I've seen her from afar. Uh, one of the days, I think it was like one of my last days, was one of her, well, I don't know if it was her first day, but it was one of the first days that she and I had a day together, essentially. We weren't working together, but we were there together. And uh, I've seen her from afar, and, and she just... She seemed like she was just really, really lovely. You know, you know yourself. You've been on big sets. These Hollywood stars come in, and there's this drama, and there's the like the she whatever. Just she just seemed, like truth, really. yeah, um, she seemed the opposite. You know what I mean? Like it's you know yourself. Like the the word gets around. You know, it's like okay, uh, traveling Judy, traveling Judy. You know, the people, all the word gets around the headsets, and you know that it's you know Judy's coming. You know, all this kind of stuff. But then she arrived, and it was just like, hey guys, how's things? Oh, we're ready. Cool. Yeah, let's have a coffee. You know, there was no bullshit with her. It was just like, yeah, I'm here. I'm ready. Give me a holler when you need me. Funny story about her is um, I went to see her in a play. I think it was the Royal Family was the play. She did that and she did another one, a two-hander, Breath of Life with um, Maggie. uh, Maggie Smith? Maggie, uh, you know. Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith, right. It was either Breath of Life or Royal Family. I can't remember which, but both times I got to meet her afterwards. And one of the times I was on really heavy medication this, and, and I was under part of the, the instruction was not to mix them with alcohol. Mm-hmm. And um, when you go and visit Judy backstage, she's always got a massive tray of champagne for all her guests. And uh, she had a, her assistant sort of come up and offer me this champ, very nice looking champagne. And uh, I, I said, I'm sorry, Judy, I won't take that. I'm on, I'm on some meds at the moment, so I'm not supposed to mix those with alcohol. And she just looked at me and went, don't talk bollocks, Lance. Don't talk bollocks. You'll have a glass of champagne. This is good champagne, and you'll have one. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so, and it was very good champagne, and I'm glad I had it because I didn't have any bad effects uh, with it whatsoever. So. Um, and now you can say you had a, a very nice champagne with Judy Dench, which is something I'd love to be able to say, but... I've done it three times. Three times. Be, I've never, you know. as I said, I've never met her, but I'd love to. She's, she's like, uh, you know, I, I hugely look up to her uh, as an as a creative and just as a person as she, well. She, she, and 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 you know what? She didn't need to give me the time of day whatsoever. The story about how I know her was uh, I was an extra on the set of a movie, funnily enough, a Kenneth Branagh movie, and I was with Danny Webb and um, her late husband Michael. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Williams, and uh, I ended up talking to Michael Williams about my career for about half an hour. Well, not my career, my career aspirations, because uh, I was really young then, and telling him I wanted to direct, and he was asking me what kind of stuff I wanted to do, and I was telling him, and he was really, really, really encouraging. And then when it went public, the news about his uh, cancer, uh, I wrote him. I wrote him a really lovely long letter um sort of saying look you probably won't remember me but you know i'm the guy who was standing next to you with the longbow man and danny webb and we were chatting uh, during the takes of the battle scene and uh when we were waiting for that big long camera to be set up and do you remember we talked about blah 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 and i just wanted you to know that um your words really encouraged me uh to sort of you know, on with my own career, and I really want you to know that. And I and I think it's very important for you to know while you're facing your your difficulties that, that these little things that you did really affected, really impacted someone else's life. And he wrote he wrote back to me a, a really nice letter, which I still have uh, somewhere. And um, he was really moved, you know. Mm-hmm. And there was a big service for him. Um, in Covent Garden <clears throat> um, that was a public service anybody could go to and it was in that chapel in Covent Garden you know the one in the square and it was yeah. packed and anybody who was anybody from the uh, film industry was there but of course nobody wanted to sit at the front right mm-hmm. because front sort of family and all the rest of it and I got there quite late and I was sort of at the back and it was all standing room only and I was with this lady who was an agent from America and she said, would you mind taking my arm? Because she was a bit unsteady on her legs. And I said, sure, of course. And so uh, then this usher came up to us and said, oh, um, you, and your, you and your mother can sit down at the front because there's some spare seats at the front because no one sat there. 
Yeah. So Judy and all her family were on the right side, and then there was a load of others. I ended up sitting opposite Timothy West and West's father with this lady. I can't remember her name. So we ended up sat, sitting on, on the front row, and I was like, I'm not too sure about this. <laughs> You'll be and called off for a speech or something. I just sort of... Anyway, that's what happened, and I escorted this woman because she was walking with a cane and whatever. So yeah. as a result of that, when everybody went out, we were the last people to come out, right? And I'm t this church had about a thousand people in it. I'm not, I'm not joking. Absolutely ram. Kenneth Branagh was there. All the, all that crowd. Mm -hmm. And because we were right at the front and on the left, we were the last. So me and this this lovely lady were the last to come out. And so I was, and Judy was at the door shaking hands with every single person that came in and having a conversation with every single person. So she, it took us an hour to get out. So wow. she must have been there for an hour. And, um, and I said, you won't, you won't know who I am, Judy, but uh, I wrote Michael a letter and I, I hope it wasn't an imposition for me to come today. And same thing again, don't talk bollocks, Lance. Of course I know who you are. You're the person who wrote him that lovely letter. And that's how... When um, I went to see her after that at the stage, she always would invite me up, up back backstage. I mean, what an amazing person! Just, yeah, you know, amazing person. She really is. You know, she's a she's an absolute advocate for for you know for cinema and for the arts in this country and in and all of them, but specifically this one. Um, and you know, she um, is legendary. I know she's a big lovey. You call her a lovey. You know, I know she's kind of very much a lovey, but she's really not as well. She's she's just very. She's just, just very one, one of the, one of the, you know, one of the gang. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like you said on set. You know, she kind of puts herself at the same level as everyone else. I yeah, mean, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, yeah. again, I'm not going to say because I, I didn't technically meet her, uh, but there didn't seem to be any sort of a hierarchy or any sort of a like a, you know any sort of a just diva crap or any crap at all. Really, it was no, just no, like no. here I am. Uh, I'm ready when you are. Let's play whenever the camera's ready. No, I could just tell she'd be just like that if you were directing her, not that she would need any direction. And um, So it's probably one of my biggest regrets that I'll, I'll, I'll not get to direct her in something. Anyway, let's mm -hmm. Borderlands. We're going to talk yes, I'm uh, just going to shout out to Jimmy Bush, who's watching in, or a good friend, and oh. uh, Diane Knight as well. I've got my list of people to mention. I've, I've got a card <laughs> with his name on right here, funnily enough. Alrighty. Well, yeah. Let's let's get into Borderlands because okay. okay. So for for people who don't know, you are a writer director, um, and you know, you've. We should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's on the title. <laughs> But for those of you, for those who don't know, uh, so all two or three of you, there, uh, Lance is a writer, writer director uh, who does dabble in other things as well, whether it be producing and, and various other things. But you write across the board, right? So it's plays, scripts, whether that be for te television or film, uh, short or feature. Uh, I mean, you, we're, we're going to get to it in a while. But you you wrote your own novel as well, Diamonds in the Sky. We'll get to that in a bit. So that's another, yeah. you it's know, not, writing. It's not a biography. Uh, no, 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 but yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a novel series, so, first of six. We'll, we'll come back to that. I've done about, I've written about 17, 18 plays, of which maybe 12 or 13 have been performed. I think thir I think 13, I think Borderlands was the unlucky 13. Oh, okay. Um, although it was a great show. It was uh, indeed. Uh, and then I've written, I've written probably about 10 TV pilots, um, as yet unproduced, um, some of them very close to being produced. I've written God knows how many feature films, and we'll talk about some of them later, mm -hmm. some of which have been made, some of which are in development hell, some of which are with other companies, some of which I'm going to direct, and some of which I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I don't direct everything that I write, and I don't write everything that I, I direct. I also do a little bit of acting, and I do second unit direction, usually action stuff, but sometimes... Uh, with directors who are directing themselves, I might come in and do some scenes when they they want a second ear, you know, mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're acting uh, in the show, in their in their film, like I did on Mark Zamet's Homeless Ashes, I I did a load of scenes for him. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's so. let's talk Borderlands. So this is a, a play that you uh, that you wrote and that you put on in uh, the Hen and Chicken here in London. In August of last, was it? Oh yeah, we're gonna pop the poster up on the screen now as well. 
you can pop the poster up on the screen. I've got the original program here as well with my lovely cast on the front. and um, Some very recognizable heads in there. A lot of our old friends. There are Tony in the middle and Lydia. Um, uh, those are the only two of the last cast. Oh, that's uh, Fiona as well there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Borderlands was the first... Uh, first of all, I need to give a big shout out to Dick and Tolson. Mm -hmm. um, co-directed the show with me we had two casts and although we both gave input on both casts we kind of had a primary cast each and um and uh that was interesting and it was double cast and we mixed the cast up uh, a little way through the run through and this is a low low budget we had no our budget was non-existent i think we lost money on the show as well uh, which was a shame uh, because with any any kind of fringe theatre production, and there's so many of them on, well, not at the moment, but but when yeah. there isn't a pandemic, there's so many of them on any given week. I think I think somebody was in in a, in a show on the fringe that I knew every week of 2019. Every single week there was someone that invited me to something. Wow. Uh, so you're fighting tooth and nail to get an audience in and you're you're very much dependent on your core fan base of supporters to come in and support you and we had a we had great support and we had a good good audiences um, mm -hmm. we were never we were never half empty mm -hmm. uh, but you had a quite a unique twist though on you had a quite a, the way you wrote this show was quite unique um in that because you briefly mentioned before first of all in a normal play there's one cast something happens it starts in the middle it starts to start middle yeah. and end that's it whereas you had two casts and yeah. and t tell us tell us what what the difference in in yeah. having the two casts and the audience participation I'll tell you about. I'll tell you what. Why don't we show the trailer first, and then yeah, then, uh, because we got we did a promo trailer that went up online. It's very short. I think Jay's got it. I do indeed. Yeah. So I'll tell you what. We'll run the trailer now or the the promo uh, feed, and then we uh, we can have a we can have a chinwag at the other end. Yeah. Yeah, 7th of October. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> 7th of October, that was running at the Hen and Chicken um, f of last four. I believe it was six weeks. It was a six or four or five? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was going to give me enough time to dash for a week, but um, it was pretty tight. Don't worry. Don't worry. I covered you. I covered you. Yeah, so that was uh, October 7th of, uh, of last year. And... Um, yeah, that was the hen and chicken. And but the, the difference in this one, opposed to uh, any regular play, was um, w the 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 two audiences to start with, and also the integration of uh, audience participation within yeah. the story. Yeah, which I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of. I've always been pro. My shows have always been leaning in this direction. There's a lot of. Um, uh, shows now which are sort of immersive theatre and of course you have the other extreme end of that which is secret cinema mm -hmm. and I love all that stuff and, and I think anything that you can do to make the audience feel more involved in a show I, I went to see um, an amazing production that my friend Will Johnson was in, we'll talk about him later um, mm -hmm. of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe at the Bridge Theatre um, just before Christmas um, fantastic actress in that called Kaziah Joseph, who I hope to be working with soon on another film project. She's amazing, giving her a shout out. Mm -hmm. And they got the audience really involved in, in, in that play, in a big play, in a big theatre, and you were all like part of Aslan's army, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and we were all like, the audience were all like the statues in the castle that got turned, turned back to life in the army, and, and the way that they involved the audience was really clever. On a much, much smaller scale, we kind of did a similar thing where the whole play Borderlands takes place in in a holding pen in in Heathrow, where this woman who's come back from the Middle East, she's come back with a kid, and something with the kid's paperwork isn't quite right, and um and the audience are considered to be other people kind of in the queue for immigration, mm -hmm. uh, but they're also kind of a fly on the wall to what's going on in this in this inter 
interrogation. So it's an interrogation play, and it's two officers, one older, one younger, one black, one white, interrogating this woman, who is a British-born woman, but but she's got a mixed background. Mm-hmm. She's got relatives in the Middle East and so on. So the whole ethnic makeup of the play and the background of the characters was very representative of the kind of current social narrative of today, which was something I really wanted to take on. Yeah. And, and then, then the, the log line for the play was everybody in the room has a secret. So all of the characters start off as one thing, but they end up like an onion, gradually revealing bits of themselves to the audience as the play progresses. It's quite a tight play. It's only like 65 minutes, uh, one act straight through. And, and then you get to this point at the end of the play where we involve the audience and the leading officer turns around and he has to make a decision. And the decision that they've got to make is release the woman and let, let her and the child go or detain them for further questioning until the next day. Now, by the time the audience reaches that decision, they know that if the woman is to be believed, if she's detained, her mother, who is ill and waiting for her to come home, the health of the mother might be put at risk. In fact, the mother might die. But then they know that if they let her go and it's the wrong decision and the child is in fact not hers, which they may or may not be, then they've unwittingly trafficked a child. Facilitated trafficking, yeah. The audience have to vote on that decision. Mm -hmm. This is a play that we're going to do again, by the way, uh, with a different cast. We're going to double up the cast again, but we are going to do it again. Mm -hmm. I have have an actor that I'm working with on a number of other projects called Johnny Neal in the cast this time around. Oh, yeah. I know Johnny, yeah. I'll talk about him again later. Um, So, but that's the the vote. And we did 11 shows. And during um, the run of the, the thing, we had six... Uh, votes to I think no we did 12 shows 12 shows we and we had seven votes to release and five votes to detain so the audience didn't always vote the same way and I think three or four nights it was closed by a couple of votes we had to do recounts mm-hmm. and Dickon and I the other director we were both dressed up as immigration officers and we sat in the audience and stayed in character the entire time and then we were part of the voting process count thing and uh, at one point, one night, a line went wrong, and I, I had to actually enter a scene and steer a scene in a different direction, which was really Ooh. difficult and quite embarrassing um, for me, not for not for my actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, but it was it was good. So we, you had this atmosphere in the theatre where anything could happen. And yeah, I mean, you were definitely pushing the boundaries of what felt comfortable. Um, was it your intention when you were writing that to do just that, to make the audience feel uncomfortable, to make them uh, to make them think about something that mightn't be PC? And also, was it, uh, was it um, what's the word I'm looking for? Was it intentional or was it predetermined that the characters would be, like, say, the white one would be white, the black one would be black, for example? Because in this... For the most part, minorities are usually the ones that are um, not represented as well as as right. they should be. But yet, in this, it was the minorities giving the other minority a hard time. So you were kind of you felt a bit weird by that. You were like, "What's going on?" Yeah, I, I, I did everything I could to break stereotypes yeah. in the writing, but. The way that the play was written, it had to be an older and a younger officer. Mm -hmm. Um, and It didn't matter what their race was. And actually, the original plan was to have an older black officer and a younger white officer in one cast Mm -hmm. and and an older white officer and a younger black officer in the other cast. Unfortunately, in the castings, we we couldn't pair up people correctly. I saw this amazing white kid... um, a young white male actor called Ashley Hodgson, who absolutely nailed the role in the casting. But I didn't have an older black female actress that was that worked right. That could have went opposite him, yeah, yeah. So I couldn't cast him. It was really frustrating. And uh, we've never cut. We've never done. Uh, uh, my Sharon Sorrentino does all my casting, and she was there uh, with the casting. Amazing casting director. Mm-hmm. Uh, need one Sharon Sorrentino is your is your lady Mm -hmm. and um she was there and it was the most difficult casting decision we've ever 
try to do. And the funny thing is, Tony Fadil, who's a good friend of mine, who doesn't normally do theatre, uh, who auditioned, and everybody got their sides in advance of the audition. Of all the actors that came to the casting, he was the one that we thought was going to be the weakest because he hadn't done any theatre before. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he admitted it's not his comfort ground, but we wanted to give him a chance because he was interested in doing it. But I think both we and he thought he wasn't going to get in it. Um, he was the only actor that came, and we saw about 40 people. He was the only one that came to the audition who was completely off book. <laughs> that's, that's the film training right there. He was completely off book. He didn't need his size. Didn't matter which scene we did. He had about three different scenes. It didn't matter which scene we did. He was—he knew them all, and he was the only actor of my six actors in my cast. And don't get me wrong, they were all wonderful. Mm -hmm. But he was the only one of the six cast members who came to day one of um, rehearsals, and he was completely off book. Wow. I mean, he was completely off book from day one. And um, and there's quite a lot too. It was quite a wordy play because the the I came to see it obviously to support yourself and 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 Tony I I know also um, and I came on the was it the last night or this penultimate night I don't remember I think it was the last night but I seen you came on the Saturday night the second from last night second from last yeah it was it was Tony and Lydia that was that's who I got to see to to see play uh, so I was I wasn't privy to the other cast unfortunately but I thought it was wonderful I thought it was really good um, if anyone's ever been to the Hen and Chicken <laughs> you know she's she's uh yeah she's watching in as well so uh yeah she is indeed let me just jump over to the comments we're getting quite a few through so i don't want to get them let them back up too much try and keep on top of that uh sean cronin's watching in our good friend i had him on yesterday uh he's mad as a bag of spanners but we love him sean buddy how's things um uh, steve ward's here lydia's looking at watching in kira brannigan an old friend from back home hey kira uh diane knight as well uh paul 375 on uh youtube is ask is saying afternoon chaps um Let's see. Uh, Ellen Morse is asking. Uh, he's asking, "What do you prefer writing, Lance? Plays, TV, or film? Um, I, irregardless of short or feature." Uh, I don't have a preference. I absolutely love writing all of them. I've just got into. I'm working on two different television, three three different television projects at the moment. One of which has a really good chance of getting made, which I'm working on with uh, Craig Fairbrass. I think I'm allowed to say that. Mm -hmm. And um, called Second Skin. I don't want to say anything about it, um, mm -hmm. but uh, me and him have been going back and forth on the script. I'm really enjoying that. That's a, a, and it's a, it's a genre that I've always wanted to tackle that I haven't. Um, Interesting. And I consider myself a writer that's comfortable in any genre, anything. Um, so I'm all, I, I get excited when I there's a genre that I want to do. I wrote a western for. Um, there's a whole load of indie directors who I call the crowdfunding generation. And um, I'll, I'll mention a few of them, Patrick Ryder, James Bush, um, Rain McCormick. Uh, these are all friends of mine. These are all lovely people. These are all people that give you time. And mm -hmm. they're all people that will also um, promote your work as well as promoting their own, you know. Uh, um, oh, there's absolutely. A of, there's a lot of people that don't do that. They, that they only promote their own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, these guys will do that. Uh, Matthew Holmes, uh, my good friend in Australia, uh, who did The Legend of Ben Hall. These are all the crowd uh, funding generation. Um, and we're all sort of looking for projects and putting irons in the fire. So I try and I try and do as many things as I can. And so I wrote a script for Patrick Ryder, which is a Western. I'm not allowed to talk about it. I think I can say it's a Western um, and I'd never done a Western before, but I always wanted to write a Western. So I was just all over that straight away. I think I wrote the first draft of that in like six days. Mm. And then um, I did Hexed for James Bush, which was a horror, very traditional horror. Again, I would not done a, a traditional horror script before. Again, I was all over that. I think I did the first draft of that in 11 days. Yeah, um, Jimmy and I are producing that one. That's right. You're working on that to, uh, together. In fact, I think I recommended you to him, if I remember rightly. I, I really love that, actually. It was Yulia. The, uh, I, I can't remember if it was Yulia first or Jimmy. One of them no, brought it to me. No. Most, probably yeah, probably Jimmy. I, I really loved it, though. I thought it was a really cool take on, on a witch story, you know? He gave me a very specific brief. He had he had some characters um, in mind, and I, I came up with some others. I think Yulia uh, 
contributed to the story as well. And they basically gave me a very specific brief and I was like, that's all I need. And I went away and I wrote a draft and then he would come back with notes. He'd like tone down the comedy here. I want this character to be a bit more serious. That comedy bit's okay. And cause I always put in funny bits, even if it is a really dark script. And, um, and that's how we worked and it went back and forth. I just did another script for the tripod guys who I'm going to give a shout out to as well. Jake Francis, uh, Ellie and uh, Joe. Absolutely. Ryan. And really lovely bunch of guys. And I just did a script for them called um, The Showdown at the Big Komodo. And that, that's kind of a cross between um, Invaders from Mars and um, uh, an 80s film called Warning Sign that most people won't have seen. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to say anything else about that script other than we, we worked on it. That's all I'm allowed to say. But, but I really enjoyed writing that script. Again, that was another genre that I hadn't really done before. Mm -hmm. so I don't really have a preference over TV, stage or film to answer the question um, as long as the subject and the story and the characters interest me and I can get into their psychology as soon as I'm in their psychology and I know the world that I'm writing in I'm off like a rocket mm -hmm. right faster than anybody else I know and 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 not to not at the cost of quality either. Mm -hmm. Because once you get to the end of the first draft, that's always the hardest bit. And the faster I can get to the end of the first draft, then I take my time and I go back and I, you know... I'm not Finesse it then. Don't, I don't do a first draft in five days and leave it at that, just so people know. Mm -hmm. I go back and then take my time and finesse it. I'm on the fourth draft of Behind Closed Doors, uh, another film I'm doing with Jason Fleming, and that, that's taken many weeks to finesse that. Mm -hmm. But the first draft of it, I did fairly quickly, you know. I'm curious so, myself because uh, I mean I've known you for years now, and I know you're super super fast at writing as well. Very 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 good, but also super fast. But I'm curious uh, when you have an idea that's either come out of your own head or it's brought to you irrelevant doesn't matter. Uh, it, it's a mo let's I don't know. I'm gonna make up something now. Let's say it's it's a movie about James Bond. James Bond goes to Mars, right? That's you the. Have, you don't have to make something up. I've got loads that are in that but, sort of stage. I can pick one. So. But my my question is when you have an idea that that's either brought to you or comes out of your head, do you write um, the story first, the plot, or do you write the characters and just write for them and then see where that fits in later? Or do you start the story at the start and work through it to the end? Sure. Sure. Uh, it can be any number of those things. I think my old school train of thought, which is something I teach in my writing workshops and quick plug, I do one-to-one -one writing tuition and I do group. Uh, writing tuition so for people with scripts particularly good for first time writers uh, just look me up find me on Facebook drop me a message and we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> that could be really important uh, uh, going forward financially for me absolutely um, all, all the links by the way are in the, in the description below um, and just so people know as I said at the start of the show this is uh, the ninth uh, live stream it will be episode 11 in series 1 and it will launch um, officially on all the major platforms as well as the video aspect i.e. this on YouTube on uh, June uh, June 15th at 2pm this, this is the only episode that's going to be 6 hours long because we've only got through <laughs> ten, one of the things we wanted to talk about so long um Oh yes. my God! Yeah. Wow. So I don't have um, a technique, a single technique, but the, the what I was going to say was the one thing I will always do above all else is I will write the strongest idea first. So, for example, uh, the Outcasts' next play, the one we definitely knew we wanted to do, was going to be a modern adaptation of Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do you know what we thought? It would be fun to do a Christmas play with the outcasts, and me and Dickon were talking about what, what could we do, and I came up with the idea that we should do Christmas Carol with um, Scrooge um, pl uh, played by Trump. Oh, so that's a, fun. It would be a modern version of Scrooge, but with Trump as Scrooge, and it would be, um, we came up with an ending which I think works and fits with Trump, so I already know what the ending is. And the first idea that I came up with, because you're obviously what, what you're doing is essentially remaking a, a Dickensian existing piece of work, but putting a modern spin on it. Mm -hmm. So you know what the key scenes need to be, but you just need to know what the modern version of those key scenes are. So there's a scene in um, Christmas Carol. So if we think back to the traditional definitive version of Christmas Carol, which, as we all know, is the Muppets Christmas Carol. Uh, <laughs> There's the scene where Fred goes to visit his 
um, relatives um, played by excellent actor Stephen McIntosh, who was in Bugsy Malone with me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Day. He's good. And, uh, he was, was in a different cast to me, but he was in Bugsy Malone with uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones, I think, was in his cast. And um, he plays uh, Scrooge's nephew, and he goes to visit the relatives, and they play the guessing game, and Scrooge is there with the ghost of Christmas present on Christmas Day, and he's talking about somebody who's foul-tempered and everything, and then Fred's wife gets it and goes, I know who you're talking about. It's Uncle Scrooge. And all the relatives go, oh, yeah. Ha. And I said, wouldn't that scene be great if on Christmas Day all the world leaders were having a secret Christmas dinner and it was like, you know, the head of North Korea was there and you've got Putin and, you know, um, but Boris Johnson and whatever, and they're all sitting around having this Christmas dinner. But Trump is the one world leader that's not been invited. Mm -hmm. and, and they're all talking about him in that same context and they're playing the guessing game and the guessing game is, oh, well, which leader didn't we invite? And it's Trump. <laughs> so, so that was that was the that scene was the scene that I wrote first for that script. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the the script that you wrote for your for your group uh, Outcasts. It's not my just a, it's not my group. It's uh, mine and Dick and Tolson's. It's a oh, theater, beg your pardon. It's a theater production company slash theater school. Mm -hmm. that we came up with uh, together um, hasn't made a penny yet, but it's an idea that we're trying to build on over time. And um, uh, and we started. This is all to do with Graham Fletcher Cook. Maybe yeah, I was just going to say that as we talk uh, about the outcast, or as you talk about it, I'm just going to pop up um, a slideshow of Graham Fletcher Cook um, and also of Angela on the screen because I know these people are very mean a great deal to you and and. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't know Graham, but I, I worked with his brother very, very briefly on Rocket Man, Dexter. Uh, Dexter yeah, Dexter, a, a shout out. I, I, I mean, if you want to know about my relationship with Graham, if you go on my blog page on diamondsinthesky.com, the the blog that I did under the 100 Letters blog is a dedication to Graham, who very sadly passed away around this time last year. Actually, it was mm -hmm. May of last year, and. Um, uh, how I met Graham was he used to run a improvisation acting workshop called Timber um, Theatre um, at Jackson's Lane, and it was it started it was started by Dexter Fletcher, Graham's brother, and Graham um, back in the mid '90s, I think. And I started going there in '97, and it was just a wonderful breeding ground of talent, phenomenal actors all kinds of ages, races, and types of people, some wonderful, quirky people. I uh, met some amazing actors there, um, Zoe Nathanson, Steve Bowyer, David Fisher, Mo Nazam, Bernard Pellegrinetti. Uh, it's a long list, uh, mm. loads of names. I, I, some I can't remember, um, Mo and, and um, Tam, Tam, Tam Solo. Um, all lovely, lovely people, and, I, and so many of them ended up working on different shows or film projects of mine. And I met all of these people because of Graham. Mm. And people went to that class because of Graham and, and um, the, his way that he had with people. And running a, a drama class with that level of talent and energy with so many big characters in the room, let me tell you, is not easy. Yeah, and, I can imagine. Um, and when Graham passed a away and not long before that he'd been trying to revive timber me and dickon who both actually taught taught at graham's class because there were periods where he couldn't run it and uh, i think i ran it for about a year and a half i think dickon ran it for about two years and uh, another actor called peter swavignon uh, ran it for about two two and a half years and um we were the ones we were the other teachers and peter's living in yugoslavian now i think or somewhere like that um, myself and Dickens said we should do something similar uh, why don't we start something up and we, we had a, a conversation with um, Graham's um, wife uh, Jeanette this is after he passed away Jeanette um, Monero, absolutely lovely woman mm -hmm. and, and said would you like us to, to carry on his legacy we're thinking about doing classes but do, do you want us to call it Timber or shall we call it something else and at first she said, um, oh, no, you, you call it Timber. You do what you want with it. And then I think on reflection, she then thought, actually, Timber was always Graham. And we were, we, we didn't mind, but we were, we were completely sort of, you know, whatever you want. 
we just we just felt kind of inspired to kind of I think it gave us a bit of a kick up the arse. I mean, I was in a really bad place when Graham passed away. Anyway, I had a lot going on in my life, none of it good, and um, and I think it really brought some things into focus for me and Dickon, who was also going through a bad time. And we said, look, let's get together. Let's do something. Let's do a play before the end of the year. Let's organise some acting classes before the end of the year. And that's how Borderlands and The Outcast came about. So I've got that mm. entirely got Graham to thank for that. And at Graham's um, life celebration, I'll call it that because that's what they wanted to call it, um, Dexter was there. I've met Dexter before. We, mm -hmm. we know each other. And Dexter, of course, directed Rocket Man more recently. Yeah, uh, the Elton John story. It was it was a really hard day, and and I've never been so wasted in all my life because it was free prosecco all day. I must have had <laughs> about fifteen glasses, and um, I, I was so drunk by the end of it. I, I was speaking, but my words were coming out backwards. So I, I thought, yeah, I've definitely got to get home now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> time to call it a day. And uh, of course, there there is uh, Graham on screen right now uh, reading your book, and yeah, uh, and yeah. of course the the third the second person in that series of three pictures is uh, unfortunately also no longer with us. Um, is Angela? Right, Angela Thomas. Um, so Angela Thomas was somebody that I knew back from the days when she worked on Bad Girls. And then we met again um, on the set of The Marchioness Disaster, which was a film, which ironically, I also did the play on that subject. And um, that was the first time we got to meet properly. I met her before, but not properly. And we, we really connected because she was also adopted. We're both adopted. And that was kind of what brought us together. And it was about... I didn't she know that. Away from a, she passed away from a brain hemorrhage thing, which I also had. Um, a few years earlier to her, wow. which is a, a story we can talk about, I guess. Um, and I've got, I've got a big scar in my brain. I've got brain damage in my brain. Um, I had a blood clot about this this big. Wow. That, um, put me in a coma for a few weeks and intensive care for about six weeks. I was in hospital for about three and a half months. I think this is in 2005. And it mm. uh, was very, very close call. Not my first either. And... Um, Damn. And so that uh, sort of near. Do you know who was sitting on the end of my bed when I came out of my coma? Jason Fleming with a bacon sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Get out, Daniel Lancey. <laughs> so I come out of this and I'm like, I'm, I'm in heaven. Why is Jason Fleming here? And it was like, I mean, Why's he got a bacon body with him? <laughs> so Angela asked me to, if I would write the, uh, if I would help her write the play about her life, which was a really dark subjects about child abuse and incest and all this horrible stuff Damn. and similar to a lot of the things that johnny hansler went through who yeah also, i've also worked with johnny a couple of times johnny is an absolute uh, sweetheart you're good very dear friend of mine and a yeah, lovely man absolutely and, and um it was a big responsibility to do that piece of work and we were working on it together and we'd only been working on it uh, we met about three times but we shared a lot of really intimate stuff. And and then this was in 2009. It was the summer of 2009. And then the next thing I get a call from somebody because we were supposed to meet to go and see a Harry Potter film. And uh, she she was in hospital. And, um, uh, and she had the same thing that I had. And I rushed in to see her. And actually, I was the last person with her before she went into her coma and um there's this sort of quite well-known story about i went out to the bus stop and i came back in again and that's all in the film the journey and um which was all a sort of about what happened to me after that mm. uh, which led to me going to greece and a whole, whole load of other things that we could talk talk about for until the cows come home but um so graham and angela in their own way graham especially uh, much earlier, 97, I met Graham. And then Angela, who I got to know really well, I think in about 2004, um, and then more so in 2008 was when we reconnected. We reconnected on MySpace, funnily enough. And then she said, will you help me write this, this, this play about my life? Uh, and we got really close and, and we were really similar. She was like a female version of me. And then boom, suddenly she was gone. 
oh, it was really hard. It was a really, really difficult thing. And um, I've lost, I've lost uh, a lot of friends under the age of 40. And quite a lot of my work has been about dealing with bereavement and dealing with loss and um, subjects around that nature mm. um, where people have been impacted by loss because I've always been able to relate to that subject. So that's why I ended up doing the play about the Hillsborough football disaster and the Marshness disaster. And um, it wasn't because I thought these things were commercially viable because they weren't really. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought that they were important subjects that I could get into. I could get my head into the psychology of the people that had experienced those things and do them justice and, and write something worthy for them mm -hmm. and, and contribute socially towards those causes at one point as well in my life i was told you know mr nilson you've got 18 months to live and i was like fuck so um i kind of made a list of things that i wanted to do and on that list was kind of pieces of work that i thought were important so i sort of did one of these pieces of work and i was still around and i thought right well i'll, I'll do the next one on the list and things like money and getting a mortgage and all that stuff were not really important because I didn't think I was going to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it didn't all go that way, and I'm still here however many years later. But um, I'm still dealing with an awful lot, but that's one of the reasons why I always picked subjects that I thought were important socially. And because you don't want to do another play about relationships that no one's going to remember in six months about mm. middle class people sitting in a lounge talking about their, their relationship gripes. So many plays about those. That was the first thing the hen and chicken said to us when we pitched them Borderlands. And they said, is it a play about relationships? And I went, no, <laughs> mm. it's a play about immigration and social divide. And um, uh, with a little bit of Brexit thrown in, and they said, "Fucking great!" Oh, that sounds. <laughs> good. Um, so um, yeah, you know. But so that's how Graham Fletcher Cook, who I will be dedicating my next film to, whatever it is. I promised Dexter, and I need to give Steve Fletcher, the third brother, a shout out mm -hmm. as well, because. Uh, of all the people that I met at Graham's funeral, he is the one who's who actually became a bit of a shoulder for me to cry on. Uh, and obviously he's feeling Graham's loss 10 times more than me. Mm -hmm. But him have had quite a few like late night chats when I've been feeling down on Facebook. And he, he doesn't know this, but he's actually helped me. He helped me get through that quite a bit. So I need to give Steve Fletcher a, a, a shout out. And Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so him and him and Angela probably shaped my career creatively more than any other two people I can think of. Okay, that uh, nicely brings us on from from one uh, rather heavy and harrowing story or you know uh, line of stories uh, to something completely different. This time we're heading for the heading for the skies. Uh, oh. You decided to turn your hand to writing a fictitious novel. Uh, called Diamonds in the Sky. I did. And we're going to pop the the uh, cover up on the screen right now. That's, um, is that that actress right there? Is that the same one from Howard's movie, Adventure Boys? That is Angela Dixon. Angela Dixon, I thought so, yeah. Who is a, a fantastic actress. Um, she's an actress I would dearly love to play the role that actually she's portraying on the cover of the book, who's the, the character of Diana. Mm -hmm. What to say about Diamonds in the Sky? Diamonds in the Sky was written to be a TV series, and it's a television series about, um, about a dozen characters set all over the world, and what happens to them when 200 alien ships arrive that look like these massive spinning top things, and they drill down into the Earth, Nothing comes out of them. No one can get in. and um, But things on the earth start to change. And um, the I'm, all I'm going to say is the barrier between the rich and the poor becomes completely non-existent. Mm -hmm. So that's where the show is going. Uh, it's quite a big social commentary. And it's quite weird because it really ties into a lot of what's going on with the pandemic. And don't forget, I wrote this book two years ago. Yeah, no, yeah. China. China plays a major role in the story, so it's quite weird. 
Is it coincidence, uh, or, or do you have some sort of an inside scoop that I don't know about? No, I have no inside <laughs> scoop. Because I, found some, I just wanted to write something which I thought would be funny, engaging, interesting. I'm a, I'm a big UFO guy. I'm a big UFO. Same. So. I love my sci-fi, yeah. I just read today, not to not to digress because we will definitely, but I just read today, just side note, uh, Elon Musk, um, so the guy from Tesla and SpaceX and so on, and, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to tell people what this little guy means, but Tom Cruise is going literally to space with Elon no, to, make an, to make his movie, whatever the next movie is, I don't know, but he's literally leaving the planet. Um, see the little guy that just popped up there. That's that's the, that's Lance's cue for me uh, that I'm that I'm waffling too much apparently. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, well, it's a special software that Jay had me download, and it, if either of us waffle too much, what happens is this little person starts popping up on the screen. So, yeah. quite a good software <laughs> app. You need to get. I understand that Sean Cronin's downloaded it, so uh, it's going to be very useful for him. Um, so, no, sure. no comment. <laughs> I love Sean. Um, okay, um, we're going to jump over to the comments uh, real quick. We've got a bunch of people watching in. Um, Edwina Forkin. Uh, hey, Edwina, how's things? Uh, she's a wonderful producer from Ireland, runs Zanzibar Films. Uh, she's been she's watching in as well, so you never know. She might pick up your pitch. Um, I'm always looking, I'll say this now, I'm always looking for producers. I also don't have an agent for my writing, and I really want one. Um it goes without saying, but I'm always looking for producers. Good producers are really hard to find. I'm working with a wonderful producer at the minute called Nicola Gregory. Oh, she's uh, great, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about her a bit later because that connects to one of the projects we're going to mention. Um, and she's one of the best I've worked with and honest, probably the only uh, honest one, um, <laughs> and, uh, completely honest. Uh, but she's fantastic, and I'd recommend her to a lot of people. And uh, her fella Dean um, Charles, who's a, a director, mm-hmm. and another one of the kind of the crowdfunding generation of directors. What other comments you said? There were some other comments. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we're actually working with Edwina. She's um, she runs Zanzibar Films in, in Dublin, which is one of the main uh, top three by by far top three film companies in in the country, and has done some incredible, incredible films that you all will know and love. Um, and her her uh, her producer uh, Larkin as well is absolutely wonderful. Um, so yeah, get get your comments into Lance. Anything you would like to ask or say or chime into the conversation, you can certainly do so via Facebook. Uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. Uh, so just pop your messages into the into the comments in the in the relevant uh, players, and and we will certainly get them over. Okay, Brian uh, Brian eighteen forty two from New York apparently uh, is asking um, when and where can we pick up a copy of Diamonds in the Sky because he like us is also uh, a big fan of sci fi. Okay, so Diamonds in the Sky, um, which Obviously, because I can't, I'm not powerful enough to commission it as a TV show. I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a Game of Thrones. I'm going to write a book. I've never written a novel before. You can get this on Amazon. Mm-hmm. So, um, Jay, if you want to Google it on Amazon quickly, or actually, I can send you the link. But um, yeah, I can pop if- the link up on up on the uh, on the window here on the screen. And of course, as always, all all the relevant links, um, including the Amazon purchase link and so forth, will be in the description uh, in the box below. Um, so, what we're going to do actually now is we're going to play a little. Um, a little trailer that you guys made maybe last year. Uh, uh, let's, let's just be clear about that. This is a short film. Mm-hmm. So it's a self-contained short film. It's not a trailer. Um, but it, 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 it doubled as a promotional material for the book, and it's set within the world of the book. But my plan to sort of complement the book series was to make a series of short films that would just work as short films on their own, mm-hmm. but are set within the world of the book. And the one you're going to show is the first one we did with my amazing actor friend, Will Johnson, who played Aslan and the Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe at the bridge recently. Awesome. Well, let's give it a spin.
How good guy. does that look, huh? Uh, of course, as we said, guys, that's available on uh, Amazon right now. If you just give me a minute, I'm just going to go give uh, Chris Nolan a quick call and see, is he busy? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean um, one of the things with that with that book series, so just so you know, the pilot for the um, show has been written. In fact, I've written the first two episodes. Mm-hmm. So uh, if I've got a producer interested who wants to pitch it, let me know. I've got about seven well-known actors attached to it, including Will Johnson, mm-hmm. and mostly, mostly British. I've written a part in, in both the book and um, the show, especially for two of my favourite actors. I'm going to tell you who they are. Oh, one thanks of, so much. One, you shouldn't have. <laughs> one of them is Reese Darby. Uh, Reese Darby is the guy who plays the band manager on Flight of the Concords. Got any gigs, Murray? Oh, um, yeah. Band meeting. Murray present, you know, that guy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely love Reese Darby, and I sent him a copy of the book. And um, I said to him, your character's coming in the se- in the second book. So his character actually appears on someone else's video in the first book. But that, because I know Reese Darby's a huge UFO nut, and I really want to work with him. Mm-hmm. So I, what's the best way of giving myself a chance of working with him is writing him a character in one of my scripts. So I wrote him a character both in a script and a book, doubling my efforts. So I've sent him a copy of the book, and he's got it. And, and uh, you know, I don't know what he thinks of it, but he got it, and he wrote me a very nice email to say thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, I've also written a part for Peter Dinklage. Ooh, Peter Dinklage. Okay. Love Peter. Yeah. Definitely right up there in my top 10 list of actors I want to work with, who I hope I still have a chance of working with in my lifetime. And uh, I thought, what would be the two best actors to put in scenes together uh, in Diamonds in the Sky that would just be great to watch? Peter Dinklage and Reese Darby. So in the story, the two characters that I've based uh, on them in the book end up sharing nearly all their scenes together. Uh, this is in book two, by the way, because book one, Parosia, doesn't feature the character, um, definitely not based on Peter Dinklage, but is very much like Peter Dinklage. Mm. And um, the Reese Darby character don't really appear. Reese Darby's character, or the character based on someone who looks like Reese Darby, um, is, in, is in the first book a little bit. Um, well, all the other characters, including all the minor characters, were all based on actors that I either knew or wanted to work with or actors that are friends of mine um, or people just on my friends list. So everybody in the book was based on somebody so I could picture them and hear their dialogue. And I find that quite a useful technique, especially when writing a book, which I'd never written before. I hadn't done a book. It was a a new thing for me. And the second novel is going to be a lot less wordy. The first one was a bit overwritten. I think a lot of I think a lot of uh, novelists who are new, mm-hmm. including myself, I consider myself very much a virgin in that territory. I think we probably have a tendency to overwrite. Just as first-time scriptwriters, that's their biggest issue. They have a tendency to overwrite. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think I had that same tendency writing the book. So the second book is going to be very stripped back. I learned so much writing the first Diamonds in the Sky book. It's on Amazon now. I've just sent you the link. <laughs> okay. You check on... Um, yeah, if you check on uh, Skype, I sent you the link. Um, it's there. Okay, and, cool. Um, uh, people can just order it. If you're in America, you should order it via Amazon.com. If you're in the UK, order it via Amazon.co.uk. If you're in America, don't order it via .co.uk. It takes about seven weeks to arrive. Ooh. If you order it via .com, it will be there within, well, a week. You know, yeah. To, um, in, in the UK, it normally arrives in seventy-two hours. So, mm-hmm. a side and, note: did did you manage to get the the first book? You said you reached out to uh, to one of the two actors. Did you manage to get it to Peter? Oh God, no! I haven't even because um, uh, got to be careful what I say here for legal reasons. I think the character that is loosely based on someone who looks like Peter Dinklage, but not based on Peter Dinklage. Gotcha. Uh, or let's just say is a role that it would be suitable for him to play if it ever became a TV show. Gotcha. That character is in book two. Okay. Um, and so when book two is out and in print, I'm about halfway through book two at the minute. I'm behind on book two. I'm really behind on it. Um, I will send Peter a copy. Mm-hmm. Via, I'll do it via the appropriate thing. I will write to him via his agent. 
And uh, in fact, the second book is dedicated to a number of people. And one of the people it's dedicated to is Peter and um, Reese Darby. Okay. Uh, the other person it's dedicated to is um, a transgender friend of mine. There's a transgender, a transsexual character in, in Diamonds in the Sky is one of the main characters. She's in the first book. And, the, and she's based on two uh, transsexual friends of mine, one of whom was murdered in london in um i think it was 20 28 beginning of 2018 she was murdered it was all over the news jesus yeah and and the guy who who got done went down hate crime or some other form of a crime basically uh was a guy okay uh we seem to be having a little bit of technical issue here um we've for some reason just drop the call on Lance. So uh, we are at the at the mercy of of the internet. So let's see if we can get him back. Okay, I tell you what we're going to do. I am going to pop for you up on the screen the link that Lance just mentioned where you can go and get um, Diamonds in the Sky on Amazon. As he mentioned, if you're in the UK, go via Amazon.co.uk. And if you're in the States, it's .com. Uh, we're going to run the trailer because a number of people uh, are saying they missed the trailer for, uh, for Lance's um, Diamonds in the Sky series, his book series. So we're going to run that again. And, uh, and see if we can't get Lance back on the phone at the other end of these. Don't forget to subscribe to The Hub for the latest episodes. You can find us on all your favorite podcast platforms and media. The Hub, your weekly fix of all things film and television and some other stuff. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Jason Mathewson.